Hey guys, welcome back to Portal of Wisdom. I'm back today with another story. So if you're new to the channel, like and subscribe and click that little post notification bell so you get alerted when I post new videos. And on to today's story. This one is another piece of Americana. If you've ever heard of the story of D.B. Cooper that jumped from the airplane, one of the first skyjackings, this is a story that we're going to talk about today. So anyhow, it starts out with, uh, I guess on the date of November 24th, 1971, which is the day before Thanksgiving, a gentleman gave the name of Dan Cooper and he bought a $20 ticket from uh, airline ticket from Portland to Seattle and he got on the plane and just a just a few minutes into the flight um, he had handed a note to the flight attendant so he was sitting on the plane he was in seat 18e he was wearing a black raincoat and loafers dark suit white shirt black necktie with a mother of pearl tie pin and black sunglasses so he's sitting there. He had ordered a couple of bourbons or whiskeys for which he had paid cash. And he hands this note to the uh, flight attendant or stewardess, Tina Mucklow. And he instructs her that this note is for the captain. So she slips it in, in her pocket and kind of disregarded it at the moment. And then he persisted in, and and uh, had her read the note. And it read, I have a bomb in my briefcase. I will use it if necessary. I want you to sit next to me. You are being hijacked. And he opened his briefcase and revealed uh, red sticks, uh, apparently dynamite and a large battery and electrical wires. And then he closed his briefcase so she knew he was serious. So then, then he... He had a series of pre-written notes which detailed his demands. He wanted $200,000 in $20 bills and four parachutes, two military type and two sport type parachutes. In exchange, he offered to spare everyone on the plane um, and two of the flight attendants. He was going to keep one of the flight attendants, which was going to be Tina Mucklow, and the... Uh, the rest of the the flight crew was to remain on obviously he needed the uh, pilots and and uh he wanted a few people as uh potential hostages so this was a northwest orient airlines flight so it lands in seattle and i believe the demands were probably radioed in even before they they landed so they start gathering up the stuff that, uh, you know, that, that he had requested. And I think they said that the plane landed about 5.39 p.m. in the afternoon. And then it taxied to a remote part of the tarmac, let off. Uh, he eventually let off, I believe there was 35 passengers. He let them off once his demands were met and they brought the the money and everything on onto the plane and the parachutes and, and stuff. And then... He had requested that the pilots, that the he had a route that he wanted them to fly. He wanted them to pass over Portland and Medford, Oregon, and then Red Bluff, California, before landing in Reno, Nevada, to refuel. And then they were supposed to go on to Yuma, Arizona to refuel, and then they were going to head on into Mexico. So he had picked this plane... On purpose, this was a Boeing 727 with the aft stairs, which means that it had the back stairway. A lot of the planes now, I don't believe, have that, but it had the, the stairs in the, in the back also. So when, when they take off, he instructs the pilots that they're to fly uh, below 10,000 feet, maintain a minimal airspeed, keep the flaps and landing gear, um, you know, keep that, that stuff lowered so that there's not any, um, I guess to kind of keep the, keep the speed down. And I think the, the plane was flying a little under 200 miles an hour, just a little, a little above stall speed. So anyhow, so it, it takes off, gets up in, into the air and, I believe it was, 
about a half hour after they took off that he ordered Tina Mucklow to get in, go into the cockpit and he locked himself in the rear compartment. And then he used cords from one of the parachutes to bind the, bind up the money. I don't know if he made kind of a bag, but he cut a bunch of the cords up and, and, uh, used it. I guess Tina said when she was heading into the cockpit, he was tying something around his waist. So apparently it was the money and probably wanted to make sure he didn't, uh, didn't lose it or whatever. But, uh, Within minutes of her being in there, then they, they got an alert that the rear cargo door had been opened, or the aft stairs, and the cabin temperature dropped to minus 7 Fahrenheit. So, it's generally assumed that he jumped at that time. It was about 8.13 p.m. There were Air Force planes a couple of miles behind, but they hadn't seen anything. They didn't see anyone jump out of the plane or, or anything. So 8.13 at night, it's probably already starting to get, uh, you know, dark. And, and so they couldn't follow behind. Uh, they, they couldn't be real close. They were Those planes were trying to watch from a little bit of a distance, and they didn't see anything. So anyhow, then at, at this point, he jumps out of the plane, and the legend is born. So now he disappears into the night. The plane lands in, in Reno. The, the Air Force pilots, they hadn't seen anything. They finally determine, you know, when the plane lands and the stairs are down and it's, you know, sending up sparks and stuff as it's landing, then uh, they determine he's no longer in the cabin. He left his tie and tie clip behind and uh, there wasn't anything else left except for the cut up parachute so at that point they knew he did jump into the night and they figured that he jumped into the night at the point that they got the alert that the that the aft stairs were down so um with this being you know 1971 the, the fbi was was on this right away and trying to figure out who this could be and there were a few suspects that that have popped up through the years and uh, we'll go over some of those suspects. Oh, one other thing to consider, too. When when you got that kind of money, um, when I did the math, that's about 21 or 22 pounds worth of money. Um, $20 bills, 200000 So, anyhow, you're talking, if you're jumping out of a plane at, at near nearly 200 miles an hour trying to get your parachute to deploy trying to hang on to that kind of money that could be uh could be difficult to hang on to something that that that's that heavy you don't really think about how heavy money can be but when you have that much of it that's that's uh you know 21 22 pounds of uh, uh of bills plus whatever the whatever he had it wrapped in whatever that that weighed and and everything too so you know there's a possibility that that when he landed he may have already lost the money the fbi for a while thought that he probably died um and you know would have landed somewhere in the forest maybe got hung up in the trees but anyhow um as they did the the ground search the next few days they never they never found anything they couldn't find a parachute they couldn't find money they couldn't find anything a dead body or or anything like that and they knew they knew pretty much right about where they thought he went uh went down at although it was you know fairly heavily wooded with you know 100 foot tall fir trees and stuff but they figured it, it was far southwestern washington Probably a bit north of Vancouver, Washington, not too far from from Portland, uh, Oregon, and everything. So he originated in Portland. Maybe he was from that that area and wanted to jump out somewhat close to the area where he started. And but you know, no one really really knew. So they get to looking into people that have uh, military backgrounds. This is seventy one, so not a lot of people were um, jumping out of airplanes unless you were military back in those days so they figured there was a good chance that the gentleman that did this had plenty of military training and and uh and background so like we said the 
FBI never found anything on the ground in 1971. They focused their area around Ariel, Washington, which is where they figure that he landed, and they had a search perimeter for a long ways, uh, quite a few miles all around there, never found anything. But the weird thing is, in 1980, a kid that was digging a fire pit um, hole right next to the Columbia River on the sandbar on the Tina Bar. Um, he's digging this hole to make a fire pit, and he discovers fifty eight hundred dollars worth of the ransom money. And that that money was was very worn; all the edges were were gone. But the serial numbers you could still you could see the serial numbers, but uh, you could tell it had been worn. It had been out in the elements for probably years, and maybe washed into the watershed and then got deposited um, in the in the sandbar there. So, anyhow, this was the first time any of the ransom money had turned up anywhere, and. They determined that it had been, you know, out in the elements for a long time. So that made a lot of people think that D.B. Cooper died in the in the jump and didn't get to enjoy his money and, you know, some of the money washed up. But none of the other money ever, ever turned up. So left people kind of wondering who D.B. Cooper was, if he survived, if he didn't survive. Um, no one really knew at this point. But this is quite a few years later, you know, you're talking, I think this was in like April of 1980. So eight or nine years later, and it appeared the money had been out there. Although they also did some, um, in more recent years, they looked at the, at the money under an electron microscope and they determined that there was, it hadn't been in the water for a super long time because there should have been more diatoms on the money, like a, a spring and a fall bloom of diatoms on there if it had been in the water for, you know, a chunk of time. And it only had like a spring bloom of of the little microscopic diatoms on it. So they determined it had just washed into the river in probably, you know, very recent months and hadn't, hadn't even been in the river deposited there, you know, probably hadn't been there for a year or even, you know, probably significantly less than a year. So it makes you wonder where it came from, but probably higher up where, you know, I guess where it finally eventually, uh, you know, with some heavy rains or something, made its way into a, a creek and got washed into the river. So now, now people are trying to figure out, well, did, did he survive? Who might have been D.B. Cooper? Look for my part two of this D.B. Cooper series, and we will go over the main suspects. There's been about three or four main suspects, and we are going to go over... Uh, three of them that people believed were most likely or had the highest probability of being D.B. Cooper. So part two will cover these suspects and get into even more details because it looks like things, things may be solved within the last couple of months now. So definitely stay tuned for part two and look for that on my channel.